Good morning. This is Rebecca Smith Aldridge, the coordinator for library sustainability at the Mid Hudson Library System. And we're so pleased you're joining us today for the webinar Social Media Tune Up Little Tweaks That Make a Difference with Sophie Brookover, the program coordinator. Social Media Manager for Library Link New Jersey. I'm psyched to have Sophie here with us today because I've been a big fan of hers for a long time. Back in 2006, Sophie was named a Library Journal Mover and Shaker, and I already knew she was a Mover and Shaker because I've been following her blog called Pop Goes the Library. She was very focused and one of the first librarians I ever saw who was really working hard to integrate pop culture into libraries from both collections and the program perspective. So having her uh, here at Mid-Hudson today, I'm pretty psyched about because She's one of the, uh, I think, leading librarians who's really stayed on the cutting edge of social media as all the changes have evolved from Facebook to Instagram to Snapchat. Sophie always seems to know what's going on and how to make the most of it to draw your community into your library through social media. So you guys got to see Sophie's bio uh, on the workshop notice, so I won't uh, harp on it too much longer. I just want to say how glad I am to have Sophie here this morning, and I'm looking forward to learning from her, and I think you will be too. Sophie, welcome so much. And thank you for coming. Well, thank you. Thank you for having me, and thank you for that lovely introduction. I really appreciate it. Um, some of you who are here today uh, may know that Rebecca did some work for my organization last spring, so I'm really excited to bring things full circle with, with her and with all of you. Um, she did a beautiful job of introducing me. I'm just going to say a couple more things. Um, my background is in youth services and school librarianship and readers advisory. So when I think about social media and how we can use it in libraries, I frequently like my default setting is sort of to think about, well, how will we use this with kids? How will we use this to, accord, um, to communicate better with our, our teen and, and child and caregiver populations? So, um, so that's kind of my uh, default setting, and I have to remind myself frequently that not everybody who uses libraries is a child or um, a caregiver for a child. Um, I try to do that. Um, another of my background assumptions for today is that everybody here is already using social media in one way or another. Maybe you're just using it um, from, a from a personal angle. Um, maybe you're using it to help develop your personal learning network. Um, but I assume that many of you are already using it for your library. So I hope that while some of the tune-up tips that I'm going to share um, are going to be familiar to you. I hope that some of them will be news to you as well. I just want to talk a little bit, uh, set the table for what we're going to be doing today. Um, these guys from the, uh, the, the pit stops in the movie Cars are here to, to help us think about tuning up. We're going to fine-tune your approaches to community engagement on popular channels like Facebook and Instagram. Um, I'd like you to think about repurposing your efforts on channels that aren't making a strong enough return on your investment of staff time and expertise. I'm a big believer in uh, sort of reviewing and reevaluating what we know and how we can use it in, uh, in different venues. Um, I'm also hoping that you'll be able to decide what's next for your library in spaces like Twitter, Tumblr, and Snapchat, bearing in mind that what's next might turn out to be what you've been doing all along. Um, if you've got something that is working beautifully, like a well-oiled race car, then you may want to just continue doing that, and that, that could be fine for you. Um, I have been using social media personally since about 2007, and it's been part of my day job since 2010 when I moved from school librarianship to working for um, the cooperative. I started working with Library Link NJ's Facebook and Twitter presences and have built them out to Tumblr, Pinterest, which actually we are retiring this year, and Instagram. This year, in 2016, I started offering um, individualized, in-depth analyses and consultations for our member libraries. These have included independent and municipal public libraries, um, school and count and excuse me, school and public library consortia, um, county libraries, academic libraries, and an association of medical libraries. So I've been able to take a look at what lots of different library types and lots of different library sizes have been doing. So the questions that I'll be posing, the tips that I will be sharing, and the resources I'll be recommending emerge from all of those experiences. 
I want to start off with my top five overall tips. Um, if you are one of those people who has to leave this webinar after the first 30 minutes, you're in luck. I'm going to give you a taste of the most important things we'll be talking about um, right now, and we'll get into more details and some extra credit later on. So the first thing I want to talk about is tidying up your accounts. That refers to things like merging pages on Facebook if you have more than one and using the same username or handle across all of your platforms. I see so many libraries using different handles for each service and I can understand why that sometimes happens. You have different people working on different platforms, maybe you're a late adopter, which I am never going to shame you for, it's totally fine. You should not feel guilty about it. Um, it's impossible to jump on every new tool immediately and sometimes you get shut out of your preferred um, username um, and, and things like that. So, however, I still want to encourage you to fix that issue because it makes for a bad user experience. When people have to search you out on every platform um, and employing maybe some guesswork, instead of knowing that you are you know, XYZ library everywhere, that is a barrier to service and engagement. Um, and it can be frustrating for you, not just for the end user. You know, These people, they want to follow you. They're taking the time out of their day. Um, you want to do everything you can to make that as easy and seamless as possible. Listen to your analytics means checking in on the analytics or insights as they call them on Facebook and Instagram for each service that you use on a regular basis. That regular basis is really up to you. It can be weekly, bi-weekly, or monthly. Um, and then you interpret the data. What's working? What's not? What can you adjust to reach your current goals? If you have reached your current goals, number one, congratulations. Give yourselves a nice pat on the back. Um, and then think about what your next goals might be. Using a scheduling service is absolutely crucial to the way I use social media, both for work plans for Library Link NJ. We use their awesome plan, which costs $10 a month um, and offers a lot of really nice features, but their free version is also very good. Um, I have nothing invested in which service you use, um, but I do encourage you to evaluate the ones that are out there um, and choose one that will work well for you and your team, especially if you're working on social media with, um, with colleagues. Um, I definitely talk a lot about embracing pilot projects. I feel like I, if a single workday passes and I don't mention the phrase, what about a pilot project, um, then, then something is wrong. Um, they're really, really handy. It's a great way to try something new um, because they are time bound and incorporate automatically an element of evaluation at regular points during the time that the pilot project is taking place. So that gives you opportunities to reflect on how things are going, um, change things midstream. It's a much easier way to get a yes out of administration, um, especially if you are working at a library with a lot of budget limitations. Um, and it's also important, I think, for from a from like a human resources perspective, I think that uh, those of us who've chosen to work in librarianship um, have done so with our eyes open as to the fact that it is a caring profession. Um, and the fact that it is a caring profession means that it's very, very easy to overextend ourselves because we're so enthusiastic about wanting to do the very, very best for our communities and for our colleagues. Um, and sometimes that means not doing our very, very best for ourselves. So uh, the limitations of a pilot project are things that are, I think, very beneficial for staff, for the library as a whole, and even for your community. It's an easy way to get people to say, sure, let's try it, because the, uh, the investment cost is low. And finally, uh, I'm going to ask everybody to reconsider email. I've been hearing for years and years and years, oh, email is dead, listservs are dead, but what I observe shows me the exact opposite. Um, email marketing and or a regularly published library email newsletter 
which might be quite chatty, um, could be a stronger choice from you for you than you might think. So, let's discuss. What are you using and how do you feel about it? In the chat box, please note what services from the following list you are already using. Um, these are Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, Pinterest, Tumblr, Snapchat, LinkedIn, Google Plus, and other. Um, so any of those that you're using, I would love to hear about. And then the second part is how, how is it going for you? Do you feel like they're working together as a whole? Is one service getting all your time and attention while others languish? Do you feel like you're managing them okay or are you feeling overwhelmed? And then I'll ask uh, Rebecca to share some of those responses. So far we're seeing just about everyone is saying they're using Facebook. We okay. see a lot of Twitter would be number two. Okay. I'd say Instagram is probably number three that we're seeing in the chat box. Okay. But people are saying they're doing the most on Facebook. Oh, we've got someone who uses Goodreads. Oh, yes. Okay, great. And Constant Contact for the e-newsletter. Great. Someone says they feel a bit bored by Facebook because the interface changes so much. Yeah, yeah. I think it is – I, right now, I personally am experiencing some social media media manager burnout. <laughs> like I'm, I'm in a, I, f I feel like I'm in a little bit of a rut. And actually, putting this presentation together is helping me figure out what I need to do next. So I'm really glad that I'm doing this. Um, hopefully, I will be able to share something with you today that will um, break that fatigue cycle. So the only other thing I see here is MailChimp. A lot of people use MailChimp as, as an alternative yeah. to constant contact for their e-newsletter. Yeah. Okay, great. All right, interesting, wonderful. Well, then I think we may have more to talk about um, with email when we get to that part than I anticipated, which is great. All right, thank you for those responses. Let's move on to the next thing. Oh, I wanted this slide to progress, and it did not. Let me see if I can... Make it behave. I'm sorry for the delay, folks. My computer is feeling a little overwhelmed. Hopefully it will progress to the next slide in due course. Um, I'm going to move on to what I'm talking about on that slide, and then hopefully when the image appears, it will still be germane. So, um, the first thing I want to tell you is it's okay not to do everything. As you will have noticed by now, uh, my style in this area is best described as enthusiastic nudgy pep talker. Um, my motto is perfectionism is a lie and you can't have it all. You have to make choices. This is something that I have to repeat to myself frequently because uh, I'm ambitious and enthusiastic and stubborn. Um, about half of the conversations I have with libraries about their social media presences involve me giving them permission to stop doing something that isn't really working for them. Um, one standout example is library Twitter. I know a lot of you said in the, um, in the chat box that you are using it. Uh, I, if we have time, I would love to hear about how that's going for you. Um, I encourage you not to confuse this with librarian Twitter, which although it is frequently fact fractious, uh, I see disagreements there all the time. I actually think that's really healthy, um, and it is more often a lively source of professional joy and utility uh, than anything else. However, many institutional library Twitter accounts are best described as anemic and or flailing. Um, I see a lot of direct cross-posting of content directly from Facebook, which often violates Twitter's 140-character rule, which makes the library in question look amateurish. Uh, I also see libraries using Twitter as a bullhorn, when the platform is at its best when it's in cocktail party mode, and relying heavily on text-only tweets, um, which is, although that's how the platform started out, you'll definitely do better relying on a mix of apt images and words to help develop your voice. Another problem that I frequently see is posting inconsistency. A lot of uh, libraries 
um, you know, they have one person who kind of does it all for them on social media, and uh, they post to Twitter when it works in their schedule rather than on a schedule that works for the people who follow them. And that's one of the reasons why I encourage people to use a scheduling service because then you can line them up in advance when you know your followers are likely to be looking at Twitter to see what you're up to. Um, are you still not seeing the correct slide? We're still on the let's discuss yeah. slide. Yeah, I am sorry about that. I don't know what is going on. Sophie, uh, are you seeing a different slide on your screen than we're seeing? Um, no. Uh, so I'm looking at two computers. I had a printer difficulty and was not able to print out my notes. So I'm looking at the presentation on two different screens. And on one, I'm on the right slide. Um, and on the other, which I'm using for presentation mode, I am on the wrong slide. And I'm also getting the spinny rainbow wheel of doom. So let me see if I can make that stop. That is really vexing. It's not the end of the universe, uh, as long as you all can still hear me, but I did spend some time on these slides and I would love for you to see them. <laughs> Sophie, should we restart this, the sharing? I would love to, uh, but right now I can't access that screen. Okay, there we go. All right, let me see if we can make that work. I'm going to close a couple of these tabs in case they are part of the problem. I think this is reassuring to everyone on the webinar that even our social media expert <laughs> deals with the same tech issues we all do. Oh, it's universal. <laughs> it really is. All right, let me close out of that. Okay. All right. So, to exit full screen. All right. All right, we're going to try this one more time, and if it doesn't work, I will apologize very profusely and restart the entire computer. <laughs> but hopefully it won't come to that. Okay, so we are, you can see what I see. I'm going to switch to presentation mode and let us all keep our fingers crossed that we are on the right slide. That is vexing. All right. Well, Sophie, while you're tr you're doing that, I just want to chime in here to fill the void. But um, I wanted to say I was so glad to hear you say if it's not working, stop doing it because I think there's a big amount of pressure that you think you're supposed to have, you know, Facebook and Twitter at the very least. And so you know, you're you're trying, but at the the same time, you're not necessarily optimizing either. But you're still kind of yeah. talking talking into the void and not getting that feedback that you might be looking for to really test is this actually working. So I love your tip that you know let's really kind of evaluate and give yourself permission to let go of something that's not going awesome. Like maybe you kind of love social media and it's fun to do, but if you're not getting a return or there's not good chatter going on through that medium for you with your local community, maybe it's not the best use of your time. Yeah, it can definitely be one of those things where, and I talk about this later, You most libraries are not the New York Public Library or the Library of Congress or the British Library. You know, most libraries are small operations with minimal staff and they are their their niche their their boutiques they're not target so although you might be speaking to a very large audience once in a while if a, if one of your posts is wildly successful and goes viral um, in the main you are talking to people who live in your community or nearby um, and who, you know, already care about the library. Um, and you, you don't, I think you can be highly effective using social media without, like, breaking the internet. Um, and that, that is completely fine. All right. Uh, 
despite my best efforts, mm, things are not working as they should. So um, with my apologies, I'm going to, uh, I'm actually going to restart my computer. Okay. I'm so sorry. Um, but I think that that's going to be our best option. So I think that's good. I think everyone would appreciate seeing the slides while you're talking, so that's cool. Yeah. All right. So I'm going to do that. So while Sophie's and restarting her computer, how about, let's use the chat box for people to start sharing uh, what they're doing that's working. Um, I see a question here about Flickr. Is anyone else using Flickr? Let's use the chat box to talk about that. So not about you guys, but I was grateful to get the tip about um, not doing the auto post to Twitter. I have a personal Facebook page um, that I tied to my Twitter account, and it often results in very awkward Twitters where um, tweets rather, where my tweet is cut off or it just says like a link to an image without showing the image. And Sophie's right; it really does look unprofessional when I do that. So that's a great tip. I'm taking personally away from this already in the first few minutes of this. I love this. People are reporting already in the chat that they just dropped Twitter. It wasn't working great, so they let it go. Oh, good tip. Delete the Facebook auto post to Twitter and redo them if they're not looking right. Oh, neat. Linda over in Cooksaki said she's using the product Library Aware, which all member libraries have access to thanks to the Mid-Hudson Library system, to schedule program posts to Facebook. So in addition to the tools I think Sophie's going to mention about scheduling your, your posts, that might be another one for us all to think about using Library Aware, where you can integrate your um, library contact info into not only program flyers and email blasts, but also have it directly post to Facebook. Thanks for sharing that tip, Linda. I see some people have come to the same conclusion about uh, Pinterest and Instagram, so that's pretty interesting that it's not quite working, not a great use of their time, so they've stopped doing it. Cool. Caitlin is also reporting she uses Libraryware specifically for Twitter and Facebook. You know, I'd be actually really interested to hear in the chat box, how much time do you spend in a week doing social media for the library. I know it might, you know, some of you are, it's just in the stream, it's organic, you're just making it happen. But if you had to guess, how much time do you spend? Stephanie says not enough. <laughs> I am back. Cool. Hi, everybody. Um, so I'm going to start sharing my screen. How do I do that? So there's a screen icon, which probably is paused right now for you. I have, I have web, okay, so I have the, um, the microphone, and then underneath that is a webcam. Ah, there we go, thank you. All right, I just needed to wait a moment for that to do its thing. Why? Well, this is interesting as people are reporting on how much time they spend on things. Some people are being pretty honest. Either it's they're not feel like they're not spending enough or they're not sure okay. how much time to spend. Someone says they're feeling pressure to join other channels, but they already feel overwhelmed by Facebook and Twitter uh, two hours a week. Some people are just doing it kind of in the stream of consciousness of things they do. So we've got people on all, uh, I think, ends of the spectrum here of how much time they're spending. And, and let's be honest, it's kind of hard to know if you're spending the right amount of time or not. Yeah, that can be really, really tricky. All right. Okay. 
this may have to be good enough for now. Um, Google Drive is acting really weird and is not letting me go into presentation mode, but this will be fine. Um, so you should now see the, um, the slide that says it's okay not to do everything. And I am going to loop back to my comments on that topic. Um, so the issue with Twitter is um, when we're talking about managing a Twitter presence um, for an institution is that it's often like a very a kind of a fussy garden. You need to spend time tending it in order to yield the blooms you want. It rewards idiosyncrasy and strong voices and it punishes blandness and inattention. So if you can't be present on Twitter almost every day um, and use it to speak on behalf of the library using a very recognizable um, and unique voice, um, that is okay. Um, there's a, a couple of ways around that. One is to pin a tweet to the top of your profile asking patrons to find you on other platforms um, and then simply check in on your mentions and direct messages weekly or bi-weekly. Um, when you're doing that, uh, one of the benefits is you can always loop back around to Twitter. You can come back to it um, if time permits in the future or if you have a brainwave about a better way to use it. Um, on the, and, and also you don't relinquish your username to somebody else who might want to use it and then you know make mischief uh, for the library, which is a thing that nobody would want to have to clean up. Um, on the other hand, practice does make better. Um, it doesn't make perfect. Uh, as I mentioned before, I don't believe in that. If you evaluate your performance on a given platform and can see some potential for success, um, beyond what you're experiencing already, you know, pluck that diamond out of the rough and polish away. Um, of course, that means you may need to stop doing something else, and I want to reassure you all that that's not failure. That is being an adult. So, um, questions for every platform. Um, these are, I was going to make a handout and have this ready for you to sort of print out and have next to you throughout this webinar. I didn't quite get to that, um, uh, but if you want to jot down these questions for yourselves, uh, something to think about, not just during this webinar, but you know when you go back to your to your day to day, um, these are the things that you should be keeping in mind as you cast your newly gimlet eye on what you're already doing and accomplishing in each space. What are you trying to do here? Who are you reaching? do you want to reach? How much time can you realistically spend? Um, if you don't know exactly how much time you're spending or if it varies widely week to week, um, you know, it might be valuable to think about what is a monthly average of time that I want to spend, um, knowing that it is probably not your primary job description. Um, you are going to need to fit it in where you can. Um, are there some challenges that you could throw money at to make them go away? Um, if so, it's valuable to identify them and uh, start making a plan for convincing the powers that be to let you do that. And if you want to take on something new, because new tools are and new use cases for them are coming down the pike all the time, um, can you delegate away some of your responsibilities or move on from them altogether? All right. So, yes, Rebecca? When you mentioned throw money at a challenge to make it go away, could you give us an example? Sure. So um, I'm going to talk about that in some detail when we get to Facebook. Um, oh, great. One, then let's do that. Yeah, yeah let's do that. Um, so actually, first we're going to talk about Instagram. Um, I think whenever I'm in one of these webinars, we sort of always start with Facebook, and I wanted to um, upend that a little bit. Um, I chose to start the tune-up today with Instagram because for the last year, Instagram has really been the starting point of about a third of the content that I post for my place of work. Um, once you have a bunch of good appealing photos, it's pretty easy to use Instagram to publish them on several platforms at once, which can be a real time saver and a strong way to keep your brand consistent across a variety of audiences. These tune-ups might be old news to some of you, but don't worry, I have a lot of extra credit to aim for on the next slide. Um, since I'm not in a library, I usually use Instagram to showcase and highlight what libraries and museums around the world 
who are using Instagram are doing really well on that platform um, to give our member libraries and anyone who follows us ideas that they can use to make their Instagram work better. I cross post our images to Facebook, Twitter, and Tumblr. In fact, this is very nearly the only way we are using Tumblr at this point after several years of fairly intensive usage. Um, our audience there continues to grow anyway, so that seems like a strategy that's just fine for us for now. Um, we talked about tidying up your accounts earlier, starting with making your username uniform across all platforms. I would recommend doing this first if it's something that you need to do. If you have been using Instagram for a short while or if your account is not heavily promoted on other platforms and library branded print materials, this will be a fairly easy process. If you are an established user with a username that doesn't match your username on other services, it might be a more labor and time intensive process. Uh, so I have linked to a checklist for how to do that without leaving any parts of your communications program behind. Um, there's a link to that on the slide that you're seeing right now. Um, the next is switching your Instagram from a personal profile, which unless you signed up for Instagram like in the last six months, your profile on Instagram is a personal profile. Um, and now they are offering the opportunity to switch that to a business profile. Um, the process is very smooth and easy. It took me about three minutes um, just a couple of months ago. And once you've done that, um, it will give you insights. And that's, of course, the Instagram slash Facebook term for analytics or data about how your photos are performing. That will allow you to boost individual posts, meaning you pay to play, um, and that gives you a fighting chance at besting the dreaded algorithm. As you probably know, Instagram is owned by Facebook, and they've been tweaking your user experience by altering the order in which you see people's photos in your feed when you check the app. Until fairly recently, you used to see all the photos posted by all of the people you follow in reverse, chron in reverse chronological order of how they posted them. But now, you might see pictures from the same account out of order. Um, you might see some pictures by accounts you follow, but not others. And you might not see any photos at all from some of the other accounts you follow. And what that means is that some of your photos are not appearing in the feeds of some of your followers. And that is very annoying. Insights will tell you more about how your individual photos are performing, and it will give you the opportunity to boost posts on Instagram the way you can do on Facebook. Um, once you have tidied up your account and switched to a business profile, you can link your Instagram account to your Facebook page and Twitter and Tumblr and Flickr if you have them. Um, this way you can post directly to those other platforms from Instagram. This automatically adds visual content to platforms that favor it and it helps you develop and maintain a consistent aesthetic across the platforms that you use. You can also reuse those beautifully filtered and edited Instagram photos and other online public publications such as email newsletters and blogs. Sophie, two questions came through yes. about Instagram while you were talking about that. Sure. The mm -hmm. first one is, does Instagram business account support multiple users? Meaning, can more than one person log into the Instagram account at once? I believe that's what the question is asking. Yes, yes. So Instagram, um, it used to be very tricky to switch between accounts. On Instagram, it's much easier to do that now. Um, so yes, even if you've made that change to a business account, you should still be able multiple users should still be able to log into your account from multiple devices. However, actually that, that question reminds me of something that's really uh, worth noting. If your library maintains more than one page on Facebook, and if you have reasons for not following my advice to merge those pages, which you may, um, be aware that an Instagram business profile can only be associated with one Facebook page. So they, they are forcing you to make a choice there. Um, that may not be relevant to you, but it is, it's worth noting. Um, this next slide, these are just screenshots from my, my work phone uh, that show you what insights Instagram provides for business profile users. Once you've um, made that switch after about a week, they will start um, giving you insights. And so when you 
tap on one of your images, um, it will look like the first one on the left-hand side where the, the two women are hugging. That's from our uh, membership meeting last week. They were uh, really amazing lightning speakers on a couple of great topics in school and academic librarianship. And um, where it says in blue, view insights, you just tap that and it will tell you how many impressions your image had, uh, what reach it had, and um, your engagement. And then it gives you a little information about what each of those means. It's pretty bare bones at this part point, um, especially when you compare what Facebook offers. Um, but I am hopeful that they will be offering uh, something a little bit more robust in the next year or so, because this is, um, this is a pretty new thing for Instagram right now. Um, are we ready to move on to extra credit? Yeah, I'll save the other questions for when we get to the question section. Okay, great. So the first thing that I want to talk about is taking better photos. Um, fair warning, this is a little bit of a deep dive into extra credit territory because there's so much you can do with Instagram and I just co-presented on a lot of this at the Library Marketing and Communications Conference in Texas last month. Um, Taking better photos is a skill that takes specific advice and practice. Um, resources and links are embedded in these slides and I'll be making them available to you after the presentation. Taking better photos should not be extra credit because good pictures are kind of the basis of the entire platform, but here we are. Um, my biggest peeves are blurry or glare ridden photos taken from too far away. Um, I also do not like photos that try to fit too many things in the frame and photos of displays um, because inevitably you can't see what is happening in the photo. Um, definitely photos that work better on Instagram are those that fill the frame, um, ones that use natural light wherever possible because they reduce glare. Um, I definitely encourage people to take photos of people in small groups from the waist up um, and to develop your eye through frequent practice. Hashtags are the no budget way around Instagram's algorithm, which is what's messing up your feed. They're not foolproof, but they definitely help. When I post photos without hashtags, they don't perform nearly as well as those that I post with them. You've probably seen hashtags all over the place online. They're just self-applied metadata that make it easy to track specific conversations. On Instagram, as on Twitter and Tumblr, there are also ways to join and participate in specific communities of interest. Instagram lets you use up to 30 hashtags per photo posted. I like to put mine in my first comment so that my caption isn't huge. That makes it more Twitter friendly. Um, you can create a specific hashtag hashtag for your library and encourage patrons to use it in their photographs as a way to let you know that they were there and as a signal that they would be comfortable with you regramming their image onto your own feed. Um, and or you can use hashtags that are already in use. There are tons of them. Be sure to use the most popular ones. For example, hashtag library is far, 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 far more popular with over three million uses than hashtag libraries which is used about 105,000 times. Um, you can look up hashtag usage frequency in advance on Instagram and create a cheat sheet for yourself. Um, you can also check in on hashtags that occur to you throughout the day. Um, I'm a big fan of Marbled Monday and Library Life. I also recommend building a larger catalog of great photos by recruiting fellow colleagues to contribute to it. You can set up a shared folder on Dropbox or Google Drive for this purpose. Um, and bear in mind that this is extra, extra credit. You, unless you have really avid amateur photographers on staff, you will probably have to train people on both taking better photos and help them set up the workflow to make this work. But if you can do it, it will be worth it. I would consider that a real investment of your time um, because it will, increase the pool of photos that you can choose from. Um, it will make colleagues um, have a sense of buy-in and a feeling that they're really contributing to what you're doing, which is nice. Um, and you'll have a, a nice boost in quality content, which I think is really great. Um, on the next slide, I think, is where I talk about um, if this, then that. So let me scooch over there. All right, if this, then that is a really handy service that um, I use in a very minor way. Um, it basically creates little macros um, that let you connect different services that you're using, um, which is very, very handy. You can 
their interface is very clean and user friendly. It's a free service. It's easy to search for existing recipes. They also call them applets. Um, or to create new ones that will suit your needs. So one of my favorite things about the service is that you can see very, very quickly if one of your recipes is activated. Um, you've got this big green button right there in the middle with the word on in the middle. Um, and then if you're trying to bring other staff members on board as photographers for Instagram or other channels, um, there are recipes for automatically uploading photos to a shared Dropbox or Google Drive folder as well. Um, I use this particular recipe for Instagram and Twitter because I find that if I try to share a photo directly from Instagram to Twitter from within the Instagram app, what gets pushed out is my finely crafted less than 140 character caption and then a link to the photo, not the photo itself. And as an end user, I find that super annoying. Um, if I'm in Twitter and somebody's cross-posted um, their photo from Instagram, I want to see their photo. I don't want to have to leave Twitter in order to see it. Um, so this, if this, then that recipe is a workaround for it, which um, works really, really well for us. And I like it a lot. So um, maybe you would like to try that too. Um, my next extra credit for Instagram is to experiment with their stories feature. Stories is a fairly new feature from Instagram. They added it over the summer in direct response to the My Story feature from Snapchat, which allows users to create an ephemeral, fast-moving feed of sort of shaggy around the edges photos. Um, they are heavily laden with meta text, drawings, and emoji layered right over the image. Um, these images in both my story on Snapchat and on stories in Instagram expire 24 hours after being posted. On Instagram, stories are great for showcasing the lighter side of daily life in the library. Um, it's very, very immediate. Um, unlike your main feed, which is you know very manicured and curated. Um, stories can let you provide tours of new materials um, or art exhibits. I know lots of libraries like to showcase um, work by community members, and this is a great way to highlight that and encourage people to stop into the library to see what's there. Um, you can also offer on-the-spot reporting from Storytime and other library programs. And it's a way to, I, one of the things I like about it is that it's a way to bring people into the library even if they can't come to the library. And it's also a, just a much looser aesthetic. You don't, you can be a not very good photographer and still do a really good job with Instagram stories because um, the aesthetic bar is a lot lower and more relaxed. Um, since we've been talking about Snapchat, what about Snapchat? Snapchat is a lot of fun, and I think that there are lots of ways of libraries to harness its immediacy to show the everyday triumphs, challenges, and humor in library life. Um, it is a bit of a hard sell for libraries, though, because there's no archive. Um, although that does look to be changing now that Snapchat are rolling out um, their memories feature. Um, and also because what analytics exist are very bare bones at this point. That may change over time. They have a huge IPO coming in the next couple of months. So that may push them to make some substantial changes. Um, but, you know, that's six step months down the line at least. Um, all that being said, it might be worthwhile for you as a staff member, like as an individual user, to establish a presence there. Um, Instagram stories feature is a very viable alternative. You don't get the personalization options with like all the emoji and funny filters to the same degree with Instagram stories, but if you already have an established Instagram account, that might be an easier way to branch out if that's something you decide you want to do. Um, the strongest use cases I have seen for Snapchat are sort of like a behind the scenes library life use um, and reader's advisory. Um, the first link on this slide, how to use Snapchat for reader's advisory, um, is by a fellow New Jersey librarian named Alana Graves. She's at the Cape May County Library System, and that is one of our um, 
our shore counties. Um, it's a very large county geographically, um, but it tends to be fairly sparsely populated um, during the months outside of the summer season. And many of her kids cannot get to the library on a regular basis. So um, what she does is take advantage of the fact that um, Snapchat, unlike every other social media platform, does not show other users who you follow. So like if you went to my Twitter account, you could see, it would say like, you know, however many thousand people I'm following, you could click on that and see everybody who I'm following. On Snapchat, you don't have that. So as Alana put it in a presentation I saw her do a couple of months ago, she said, nobody is too cool to follow you on the follow the library on Snapchat. Um, and so she uses it for one-on-one um, -on -one readers advisory because she uses the, um, uh, the sort of like the personal messaging function of it for that. Um, I've included some links from uh, Book Riot. They have some a great starter pack on bookish accounts to follow on Snapchat and also some great tips on how to talk about books there. I think that that's a solid possibility for you. You can use the same tips for Instagram stories if you decide ultimately that Snapchat's not going to work for you. Um, and if you want to actually learn how to use Snapchat, whose user interface is terrible, um, the best guide I have seen and the one that helped me so much over the summer when I was grappling with it uh, is NPR Digital Trainings. Um, they have a great step-by-step -step on how to use it successfully. Um, we are going to move on to fine-tuning Facebook, and then after this, I'll, I'll take questions. Um, Facebook, of course, is the big granddaddy of them all. I rarely tell any library that they have to embrace any specific platform, but you do pretty much have to have some presence on Facebook, if only to protect your library's good name and to prevent any mischief makers from messing with it. Um, the first two items on this list are things that you may well have already taken care of, but for those of you who are still using a shared login, meaning multiple people logging into your Facebook page as, like, reference at abclibrary.org, um, which leads you directly to your page, not to your personal profile that has an administrative role for a page. Um, if that describes you, you should fix that ASAP. Facebook uses boost, post boosting and advertising as both the carrot and the stick in this scenario without upgrading um, to a page with um, multiple administrative roles, you have no ability to boost posts from your page. If your library's administration or trustees prevent individual staff members from managing a Facebook page using their personal profile, you can set up a personal profile for a dummy account as your main page admin, but there is just no way around it. Pages must now be managed by a personal profile of some kind. Um, they have not resorted to locking people out of their pages, um, they're just making it as unpleasant to use as possible. Um, if you have multiple pages associated with your library um, for individual branches or individual departments, for example, now is the time to merge them into one page. Almost without exception, multiple pages are difficult to manage, they create competition where there should be teamwork, and they muddy the strength of your brand. Merging is a very straightforward process. You may well have more challenges getting other team members on board with this idea uh, than with actually executing the steps to complete the task. Um, Facebook's instructions on how to do it are very clear, um, and that's the link that is embedded behind merge pages on this slide. Um, as you have probably noticed, Facebook pages work differently now from how they did just a few years ago. Um, content is subject to the dreaded algorithm, which uses a slow ripple effect to determine how many people will see any of your individual posts. Um, let's say you click publish on a post about a library event. Facebook then shows that post to a small percentage of the people who like your page at first. And then it waits to see how many of them like or love, cry at, um, laugh at, or express anger towards that post, or comment or share it. Um, as that number of engagements increases, the circle of people who see the post in their own news feed increases. If no one bites quickly, Facebook assumes nobody wants to see it and it won't place it in, 
other people's news feeds. So that is why making and keeping a standing date with your insights is so important. Facebook updates them automatically each week. You can view them and make notes or even download them as an Excel file as regularly as you want, weekly to quarterly, and you can download data retroactively for up to 180 days worth of information at a time. This is actually a 2017 resolution for me. I look at my insights every week, but I have yet to take a really long view, and since we have been running this page since about 2011, um, there's a lot of data in there waiting for me. I am excited about it and also a little bit nervous. Um, your insights will tell you how well your content is engaging your audience. Always remember, with notable exceptions like the Library of Congress or the New York Public Library, most libraries are small brands. You may have some outlier posts from time to time, something that gets shared by the right person at the right time and goes viral, but in the main, if you can post steady, incremental growth month over month, you are winning at this game. One tactic that I see working well in terms of both playing the game and serving your community as well is joining and participating in relevant local and professional groups on Facebook. These can include parent and caregiver groups, groups affiliated with schools in your area, local free cycle and yard sale groups, groups for accountants, business managers, crafters, homeschoolers, and so on. When you post something in a group, anyone in the group who is also your friend on Facebook will receive a notification that you posted there. When a group member comments on a post in a group, that post gets pushed up to the top of the group's page. It's easier to see and search for and participate in conversations in groups than on pages because they're structured differently and are fundamentally conversational bulletin boards, not PA systems the way pages are now. When you join a group as a representative of the library, of course, you'll want to make sure that your participation is at the same professional level it would be if you were working with group members face-to-face -face at the library or at an outreach event. Um, next, I am going to show you some of our recent insights. Um, hang on one sec. I just need to sync myself across both of these. All right. So here's just a little bit more about insights. As you know, um, that's your weekly robust data report from Facebook. They let you develop hypotheses about when your fans are likely to see your posts and about how well your posts might perform, and then it lets you test those hypotheses. For example, when I'm looking at uh, this screenshot, I hypothesize, um, it's a screenshot of all the images or a bunch of the images from um, a photo album that I created last week. So I hypothesize that people like close-up photos of small groups of people more than they like large crowd photos or images of text, and that makes sense because when you see a photo of like two or three people who, you know, are your colleagues in the state who you know well, you know, it gives you a warm fuzzy, you click like, uh, maybe you share it somewhere. Um. And, then, and they're much more likely to see the cover image of a photo album than any other specific image in the album. Uh, and the reason I hypothesize that last bit is that the, this one photo uh, that's got, uh, that reached 450 people and 77 people clicked on and eight people you know, liked or shared, that's the cover image of this particular album. And I chose it specifically because although you can't see it, the particulars from where you're sitting, it's a really great picture of two very happy people um, and uh, who are very well liked throughout the state. So people saw that photo and said, oh, it's Luca and Mimi. We love Luca and Mimi. Click. Um, so that's a hypothesis that I can test down the line the next time I create a photo album. Um, I want to talk a little bit about boosting posts and inviting page likes from boosting boosted posts, which that last one is something I learned about um, just in the last couple of months, and I'm very excited about it because it works beautifully. Um, so as we've been saying, the algorithm suppresses organic reach, um, which means that's how many people lay eyes on your posts without you taking steps to make sure that it lands in their newsfeed. Um, so because it suppresses organic reach, that leads page managers to pay to boost posts. If you can afford to and are permitted to do so by rules governing library expenditures, I encourage you to experiment with post boosting. This would be a great pilot project. Um, you know all those things that you've liked on Facebook, the demographic information that you've furnished to them, the interests that you've shared, all of that is now segmented advertising data, which enables page managers like us to serve selected posts to each other and everybody else on Facebook. You give Facebook um, credit card information 
or direct debit information or PayPal information. They want to make it as easy as possible for you to give them your money. Um, you tell them about the demographics that you would like the, to boost the post with, um, including geographical radius, um, age, gender, and interests. You set your budget and you're off and running. Um, each time your post is liked by any Facebook user, you receive a notification about it, and then you can invite anyone who's liked one of your posts to then like your page on the basis of them having liked that post. Um, so that ultimately winds up improving your organic reach down the line, because those are people who have taken steps to say, yes, I like what you've done here, and I like what you're doing overall, please show me more of this. Um, it's all really fiendishly clever. Um, let's take, actually, I, I'm going to do this one after I take questions. So after, let's do questions now, and then I'm going to switch back to email. Okay, um, we had, let's start with the questions from Instagram and then we'll move on to the Facebook questions. There was, sure. let's see, two more questions in the Instagram area. The first one is, um, if you're the administrator for Facebook, do you also have to be the administrator for Instagram in order to link the two together? Um, no, because, <clears throat> excuse me, Instagram has... Let's let's think of Instagram and their rules and possibilities as Facebook Lite. Um, there's no such thing like Facebook right now. If you are a page administrator and you go to um, your your page roles page, so many uses of the word page. If you look at your page roles, you'll see that there are like five or six different levels of administrative roles for Facebook. For Instagram, it's just, do you have the login information? Do you have the username and the password? Yes? Okay, you're running the account. So it's it's a much more, um, or it's a much less hierarchical management. So if you, like let's say that you, the person who asked this question, are the admin for your Facebook account, but um, one of your colleagues handles all the Instagram stuff. As long as they have some type of administrative access to your Facebook page, like as long as they're an admin or an editor or an analyst or one of the other roles on Facebook, they should be able to link it to your, link the Instagram account to your Facebook page. And then um, they can choose on an image by image basis um, which Instagram photos they also would like to cross publish to the page. Cool. Does so that, does that I, answer the question? Yeah, I think so. And if not, hopefully the person will tell us in chat it didn't. <laughs> okay. Um, the other question was, can you set up an administrator role like you can on Facebook but on Instagram? Uh, I think I answered that in the last okay. question. No, no. It's just as long as you have the login, that's it. There's, there's only one level, which is can you log into the account and post from there? If yes, then, uh, I mean, you can call it an administrator, but... All right, cool. Valerie is saying, yep, she's got it now. All right. The other ad, uh, Instagram question was, can you address teens and juniors separately from adults on Instagram? Um, meaning, can you have, is the person asking, should they have a separate Instagram account that just focuses on, like, teen stuff in the library? Well, I'm wondering if, if maybe it's kind of what's the best practice if you've got different audiences you're trying to appeal to, do you need separate uh, Instagram accounts or is there, can you use the same same account and just be doing things a little differently depending on who you're trying to reach? I would, I would do that. I, I think I can definitely see the appeal of having a separate account um, for your teen users. Um, but I think in the long run that doesn't serve the library well. Mm -hmm. um, I just, yeah, I, I, I can definitely see the appeal. I don't recommend it. If, if, it, if that works better for you, um, then, you know, go ahead. <laughs> um, I would say in the main, I prefer to see 
as I prefer to see as much diversity represented in your account as possible, and that's I think to me that's kind of the top priority. I want to see in Instagram. I would like to see um, community members of all ages being shown using the library. Um, I think that that's a real empathy building exercise, and that's not necessarily your primary aim with your Instagram account, but I think that it's a very positive consequence. I think that's good advice to be consistent with just one account on each channel to maximize who you're talking to. So let's roll yeah. into the, the Facebook questions. Um, I think this is a, a question we're all kind of struggling with. And you were talking about how when you first post something, it goes to kind of a small circle of people that like you. So what are some of the best practices for increasing that initial engagement chance when you first post something on Facebook? Sure. Um, number one, images and video work better than text. So um, if, even if what you want is for people to click on a link, what I recommend you do is anchor the post, create it as an image post or as a video post, and then in your caption, which should be brief, that's another tip that I definitely encourage people to embrace, um, it should be brief and snappy, you know, pretend you're a headline writer. What's the lead? You know, like what what is, what is going to make you you are trying to create clickbait with only the like the positive connotations of that and not the negative connotations of that. Um, so anchoring it in something visual is going to be a lot more successful. And um, putting whatever link you would you might want people to click on in the caption, which should be brief. Um, this is another way that you can sneakily but reasonably and professionally use your membership in various groups. So if what you're posting about is relevant to, um, you know, your members of your local Rotary Club, um, you know, share it on in their group once you've posted it to your, like once it's been published to your page, you can share it with other groups. And I think that that's also a really good way to make sure that um, that people are seeing things. Um, if you are um, in a, working in a partnership with another community organization or if you're just giving a shout out to um, another organization that's active on Facebook, you can tag their pages um, and it will show up in their feeds and also maybe in the feeds of people who like them. Um, that last maybe is a no guarantee, but it's certainly worth a try. Um, yeah, it's a real game. Sophie, a related question to that was someone asking for confirmation. Can pages join groups? Ah, okay. Let me clarify that. That's a great question. Fa pages cannot join groups. Individuals can join groups, and that's actually another part of uh, the, my rationale for making sure that you're managing your page as yourself um, or as a, a, a dummy account that represents the library. Um, you need to have actual people, which are represented by Facebook profiles, managing pages. Cool. So you can have a, a page, uh, you sign up as an individual that's like, you know, the library, then you create a page as that individual. And then when you're liking groups, you're doing that as the individual account, not through the group. Correct. Gotcha. Correct. And you can also, and you can do that also, like, I, I recommend that as sort of a, a fallback position, like an alternate um, I've, I definitely see libraries where the main administrator of the page is, you know, uh, a, a historical figure from the town mm -hmm. or like the, the library's founder. I definitely see my share of Melville Dewey's. Mm -hmm. um, that's, that's what I mean when I'm talking about a dummy account. And that's fine, um, but it's preferable um, for you to, to be a page admin as yourself. So I administer the Library Link NJ page as Sophie Brookover, and as myself, I'm a member of a wide variety of groups. So, um, and that's often a, a good way, a, a successful way for us to um, promote some of our content. And of course, you want to be ginger with that. You don't want to um, be doing it every day. That gets to be a little bit spammy. Sure. So just use your use your judgment. 
Thank you for clarifying that. The other two questions are really related to um, the insights feature that you were showing before. Um, one was someone was looking for clarity in the terms used on the insights page, making sure they understand what they actually mean. Okay, uh, did they have a particular one in in mind? I, I, I'm probably going to refer you to um, Facebook's incredibly robust help section. They have a ton of documentation that explains all their weird terminology um, and gives you step-by-step -step instructions uh, if there are changes that you want to make. Okay. I don't think I can go into too much more detail because we have a lot to talk about. Okay. Um, let me just ask one more question. Sure. Is it possible to transfer the page to another account? Um, are you asking... Is it possible to stop being the administrator of a page? I think it might be if like, yeah, like if you had a staff person who established the page using their individual um, account and you need to, br you know, bring it up to a level, a level to that, you know, dummy account, the Melville Dewey one. So you have more um, flexibility when there's turnover and staff. Yeah. Um, I believe all of that is covered in Facebook's uh, page administration help section. Okay, great. Yeah. We'll let you get, get yes. going, Sophie. We don't want to miss any of your content today. Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So I'm going to go back one on this screen. All right. Plot twist. Let's reconsider email. You may or may not be able to see uh, that is Mark Twain um, there behind the headline. Um, like him, reports of email's death have been greatly exaggerated. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, the, I've been hearing reports that email is on the way out for at least the last 10 years. Uh, but yet here we are in the midst of an email newsletter renaissance that shows no signs of stopping. Services like MailChimp and to a degree their free service Tiny Letter, Emma, Constant Contact, which I know a bunch of you are using too, um, and, and many more besides, they offer attractive, user-friendly, feature-heavy email newsletters. Um, most are free for small audiences and they all offer discounts for nonprofits. Uh, we just started using MailChimp at Library Link NJ and they also offer a small discount if you agree to use two-factor authentication to further secure your account, which is nice. It's great to save money while uh, protecting your intellectual property. Um, so those are definitely things to look into. Um, this can be a real boon for libraries because your community probably already expects to see you in their inbox re regularly to let them know about programs and events, to remind them that a hold is ready for pickup and to admonish them gently about their overdue items, something that absolutely never happens to me. Um, it can also um, be a less intimidating way to develop your voice as a writer because it may feel more immediately personal to write an email um, than to write a tweet or a Facebook post. So if um, the quality of your voice on any of these platforms is a challenge for you, um, I would suggest um, working that out in part through um, an email newsletter. And it sounds like a bunch of you are already doing that. So. If you're already walking down that road, um, bear in mind that you can repurpose both images and content that you have posted on other channels. Um, you can put that in your email newsletter and supplement them with extra content such as, and these are just some things that I came up with off the top of my head. Um, for example, the reference department's top five obscure genealogy resources, um, tech services weirdest repair problems ever, or your circ manager's favorite books of the year. These can be regularly occurring features um, for things that are really popular. Like uh, you know, I worked at one library where we had a, a lake right behind um, the children's department and um, it would freeze over every winter and one year uh, and every winter like this family of ducks and a group of Canada geese would stick around. Um, and then one year we had this hawk that came by and um, <laughs> murdered a duck right on the ice. And and it was horrifying, but uh, it would have been a great thing to talk about in the newsletter that week because it was a completely unique thing that had happened at the library and would give people a sense of what's going on behind the scenes. Um, so that is one way that you can lean further into being a niche brand. Um, and now we're going to talk a little bit about using Twitter in that way. I know a lot of you are using Twitter. 
um, and I'm curious as to how that's going for you. Um, as I mentioned before, although I love Twitter as a professional and personal learning, networking, and general socializing tool for myself as an individual, um, I've grown very skeptical of its utility for small institutional brands like libraries. It's very difficult for a small brand, especially one that might be bound by institutional constraints, um, to cultivate a large audience. The platform strongly favors opinionated and idiosyncratic voices wielded by people and brands with a lot of time to spend here. That may not suit you as a small or niche brand, but you can make it work for yourself, particularly if you know your niche and you lean right into it. If you want to invest some time here, think carefully about a few things. First, your voice. Who is your library? If the library were a person, what would they be like? The enthusiastic, knowledgeable favorite cousin that everybody wants to hang out, at, hang out with at Thanksgiving? Um, a cool voice of wisdom? A slightly wacky uncle? your town's best friend. Um, pay attention to the way that you hear people talking about the library when they're really thrilled with how their service interactions with you are going, and make note of the words that they use to describe the library. And build your voice from there. Try it on for size and see how it suits you. Um, as for images, Twitter started as an all-text medium, but it's really embraced images and video in the last few years, to the point that well over half of my timeline on any given day is dominated by visual content. Twitter has partnered with the popular animated GIF service Giphy to make it very easy to insert GIFs into tweets right from um, your composition screen, and if you use a scheduling service like Buffer or Hootsuite, you can add images from any links that you are sharing there very, very easily. Um, once again, I cannot overstate the utility of scheduling services. I've been using Buffer for years and would pretty much be lost without it. They offer link shortening, analytics, scheduling for both tweets and retweets, support for images, and support for teams of users. I'm sure other scheduling services offer comparable features because they're all in competition with one another, um, but it has been some time since I investigated any of the others very closely. Um, bottom line is if you find one that works for you and your team and your budget and you like the user interface, um, that's a great thing to do for yourself. That's a gift that you can give yourself. Um, and of course, you should check your analytics monthly. Um, if you haven't enabled these in Twitter yet, you can access them by logging into your Twitter account, clicking on your avatar, and then selecting analytics from the drop-down menu that will appear. This data is updated daily with robust information about how each tweet is performing, which is really, really handy. Um, I do have some Twitter extra credit to share with you. Um, oh, hang on one moment. All right, so while that's hmm, eventually going to scroll down, um, Twitter, the first thing I want to talk about is rescheduling your own tweets. Um, if anybody is already doing that, please do make a note of that in the chat box. I would love to get some anic data about how that's going for you. Um, as I'm sure you've noticed, Twitter moves very, very fast, so chances are good that unless you strike virality gold, most of your followers aren't seeing most of your tweets. You can improve your chances of being seen, heard, and engaging by reusing or rescheduling your own tweets. You can simply copy and paste them, um, particularly announcement-type tweets about events at the library, uh, several times throughout the course of a day or a week, or you can use a scheduling service to reschedule individual tweets to reach a larger audience. Another um, power Twitter use is live tweeting major cultural or sporting events. Every event from a, an episode of Game of Thrones to the Super Bowl has a hashtag associated with it. You can hop right into one of those bandwagons and join in the conversation, providing useful commentary, fact-checking where appropriate, and the occasional link to resources that fellow fans may enjoy. This could take place outside of library business hours, so it might not be feasible for some of you, but it is worth considering as an experiment in building the library's presence on Twitter, or even just as an exercise in building your own skills as a Twitter user. Um, in a completely opposite direction, oh, I went too far ahead, let me come back, there we go. Um, in the completely opposite direction, if after careful consideration you decide that your Twitter presence is not worth spending a lot of time on, you can radically downshift to a very minimalist approach. One way to do this is to craft a tweet that says, in effect, 
please find us on Facebook or Instagram or wherever people are more likely to find what you're doing on social media um, and include a URL to where they can find you and an image that captures the essence of the library. You'll pin that tweet to the top of your profile so that anyone coming to your profile will always see it right there at the top. Then you'll check in and on your mentions and direct messages weekly and you can continue to publish updates about program cancellations, weather-based closures, or other information that you know people rely on, but you can reinvest your time elsewhere. Um, nobody said they were using Tumblr, so I may skip it in the interest of time. Um, this information will be available in the slides later. Um, do people have strong feelings about Tumblr? Do you want me to go over it very quickly or move on? Sophie, I agree. No one brought it up when we started. Um, I, I would say go ahead and skip it. Okay, that's fine. It will be there for you later. All right, so let's talk about how hard it is to say goodbye to yesterday. Um, first, services come and go. For example, Twitter announced last month that they are discontinuing their short-form video service Vine. Um, if your library has been using Vine for years, now is the time to decide how you will handle the shutdown. You can export all your videos to another platform in case the current plan to let them remain available on the web crumbles to dust. Um, you can delete your account. You can do nothing. Uh, you should check in with your municipality's lawyers about what your legal obligations regarding this content are. Um, second, sometimes a communications platform Form outlives its usefulness for the user. At Library Link NJ, Pinterest has proved to be an experiment that we're not getting value of continuing with anymore, so we are sunsetting our account. Um, in preparing this presentation, I realized that it's time for me to reconsider what we're doing with Tumblr. Um, we met our original goal of learning how to use it and demonstrating usage for our community and providing continuing education about it for our members. Um, and connecting with other Tumblrians. So what's my goal now? Maybe there is no new goal and it's time to explore something else. On the other hand, it could also be time for me to invest more time in this platform. The bottom line is that it's time for me to question my current assumptions about what place Tumblr has in our communications strategy overall. And you may be feeling like you're at that point with another service at your library. So I want you to think about what your ecosystem of platforms is doing for you. Are they working well together? Together. If they're not, what workflow and or assignment adjustments can help you? If it's time to let one or more of them go, conduct an exit interview with yourself and any other colleagues who are working on communications and social media. What did you learn as a user of this platform? Can you use those skills in another platform or in another area of your library services? These are all really useful things to think about um, and will help you if you're deciding to um, if you're trying to decide to do something new, especially. Um, I would be very remiss if I did not encourage you to steal my resources. Um, this is a handful of the things that I find most useful. Um, one is the Buffer blog, which you can use and subscribe to even if you don't use their service ever. Another is Later, which is an Instagram scheduling service. Um, I didn't really talk about later in this presentation. If you want me to get into some of those details, I can. Very briefly, it allows you to schedule Instagram posts from any computer, from any desktop, um, from mobile devices. It's really, really handy. Um, and then it sends you a little um, a push notification when you're when you have told it you want to schedule your your post to go through. Um, Buffer's blog covers social media and marketing and communications all the things about those topics. Later's blog, Later's blog really focuses just on Instagram. Um, and you can either bookmark them um, or follow them in your RSS feeder of choice. Um, or, your, um, or you can subscribe to them as um, they repackage everything as an email newsletter, which you get a couple of times a week. So they are really, really useful. I got a lot of my best ideas from there. Um, I've mentioned NPR training before and talking about Snapchat. They are amazing. They've got a blog. They have free webinars, which are targeted specifically to people in public radio, but I've sat in on a bunch of them, and there's been a ton of useful insights for libraries. Um, and they also do step-by-step, -step, here's how to use tool XYZ on their, on their training website, so I highly recommend that. Um, 
And then the two Facebook groups that I have found most useful as someone who works on social media and marketing are the Library Marketing and Outreach group, which is um, specifically a group founded by members of ACRL. Um, so the focus does tend to be academic libraries, but um, a lot of what a lot of the conversations and resources and ideas that people share there are applicable to libraries of all types. It's a really, really great and uh, welcoming group. And then the last one is the Libraries and Social Media group on Facebook, which has over 7,000 members and um, is just essential for me uh, to keep up with new developments in current platforms and emerging platforms. Um, everybody who knows good stuff about social media and libraries is on there. So if that describes you and you're not already there, you should definitely join. And that is it. I am, we have about 10 minutes for more Q&A if you would like. And of course, I welcome follow-ups at my uh, email address or on Twitter. Cool. Thank you, Sophie. We definitely have a few more questions if you don't mind. I do not mind. Cool. So these popped up during the um, e-newsletter section of your presentation. The first question was did, whether or not you had recommendations of the frequency of e-news, monthly, weekly, or event by event. That's a great question. Um, I would say the most important consideration is to think about how frequently you can, what kind, what frequency you can realistically commit to. So. Um, for Library Link NJ, we produce two newsletters monthly. One is our e-update, which is sort of like, here's what's going on at Library Link NJ, and some program announcements. Um, and the other is Social Media Snapshots, which is a repackaging of most of our content across different social media platforms. Because we had a bunch of members tell us, you know, I like social media fine, but I just find it so much easier to see what you're talking about in email and I can share it more easily with my staff members that way. So that is a frequency that is something we're able to maintain consistently. Um, I think if your users are already receiving the occasional um, like program announcement blast, you know, a, a bi-weekly email from the library is is fine. I would say you, you don't veer into spam territory until you are sending like five emails a week to your to your um, subscribers. And you can with if you're using a service like MailChimp or Constant Contact, I know you can segment your audience pretty narrowly. So if you have like just one master list, um, a long-term project that you might want to invest some time in in 2017 is uh, segmenting that down to like people who are interested in adult programs, people who are interested in children's programs, teen programs, et cetera, et cetera. Great, that because that, that actually answers the next question on e-newsletter, so Perfect. thanks for doing that. Um, Great. We've got a cool question from Courtney, uh, who works here both at Mid-Hudson and for the Pleasant Valley Library and is about to graduate from library school. Yay, Courtney. Oh, um, wonderful. Right? I know. Um, so here's Courtney's question, which is a great one. She says, it seems like there's a lot of info about how to conduct social media outreach, but not a lot of concrete research that lends itself uh, that it's actually increasing program attendance and circulation. Do you feel like this is an area we need more research on or is establishing a community on social media to provide patrons with positive library related online experiences just as important? Um, yes, I think the latter is, is very important. It is actually what social media is much better for. Um, implicit in my slides, though I don't think I have said it out loud yet in the course of this conversation today, um, is the notion that social media is actually not great at driving program registration and attendance. And it is, it can be more effective at um, driving users to your online catalog and to place holds, um, especially if you have um, you know, let's say you got in 10 more copies of uh, Harry Potter and the Cursed Child, or, you know, you, you, you knew based on your circulation information that all of the Neapolitan novels by Elena Ferrante were super, super popular, and so you knew you were going to need to buy, like, 10 extra copies of, uh, of the last book in that quartet. Um, you know, that 
is something that you would probably want to include in your in your newsletter. But the um, but as far as posts on Facebook, like the the things that I like to see least coming from libraries are like exhortations to sign up for specific programs or you know come to the library and see X Y Z. Like no, just take a really great photo of it. You know, like the invitation is implicit. You're a public building. Um, so yes, I think using social media for um, like community building purposes and to highlight here's what's happening at the library um, through visuals and uh, appealing um, written content. Uh, I think that that's more effective than specific program advertisements. So that kind of speaks to my main question uh, for you, which I'm going to ask while if there's any other additional questions that want to come through chat, here's your chance. Um, but you started us off with the right thing. You said, what's your goal? You know, what are those questions you have to answer when you're really thinking about how you're going to evaluate your effectiveness? And I think I'd love to hear that from you. What, what, when you're setting a goal for yourself on social media, what does that look like? Sure. Well, I think about what is it that I want to use the specific tool for. You know, as I as I've mentioned, I'm not in a library, so I'm not thinking about, you know, how many people are coming to my story time or how many people came are going to come to uh, you know, an author event or something like that. I I'm usually thinking about it in terms of what skills can I build secondarily and primarily what can I show our members to give them an idea of what they can do for their communities? So, you know, my goal is usually to uh, to follow widely, get the lay of the land, and figure out a way to make make a strong case for the tool um, for our members, so that uh, I take some of the guesswork out of it for them. Um, all of our member, you know, staff at our member libraries know that they can contact me um, to bounce ideas off of me um, and to um, and to get, you know, sort of an in-depth analysis of what they're already doing and some suggestions for what they might be doing um, down the line. So I think I'm always looking for use cases for different our different library types and uh, and also thinking about okay well what skills can I build here what skills do I already have that will make it easy for me to be successful in this area and how can I showcase what other libraries are doing so that our libraries um, can be doing the best for their communities and what do you see from the most successful uh, public library social media presences that you're looking for. It sounds like you really did a great job of summarizing, you know, pictures, 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 and videos, keep it short and sweet. Um, are there specific engagement levels that libraries should be looking for, or is it just kind of like trial by error? Um, I think that it's kind of both. You know, uh, I think it's completely worthwhile to set yourself a goal of, you know, like in the Two, first two quarters of the next year, we're going to add 50 more page likes to Facebook, you know, that kind of thing. I think those types of really concrete goals are, are worth setting. Um, but I also think that there has to be room for trial and error and experimentation. I think that when we give ourselves too many, too many rules, I think that that can really, really stifle creativity and what makes using these tools fun, which they should be. You know, it's, yes, it is work, but there should be an element of fun in using them because they're, they're social. You know, it's about making connections with people. You want to, you know, I try to make sure that our presences on all these different channels are vectors for both information and delight. So that's, I think if you can keep those two things in balance, then um, then you're more likely to be successful and also to enjoy what you're doing. 
Sophie, that was imminently quotable, uh, information and delight. And I think you really uh, kind of summed up the whole reason we did this webinar today, which is really looking for new opportunities to engage with our community and be a neighbor in our community. And that's a very social thing. So taking the formality out of social media and just being uh, the neighbor that is your library on social media, just like you are when people come through your door, I think is great advice to wrap us up here this morning. I just want to say thank you so much, Sophie. Is there any parting words you'd like to share with the group before we sign off? Uh, no, not really, but thank you all for being here. Um, this was a treat. I hope I was able to answer all of your questions successfully, and I'll be sure to um, give these slides to Rebecca and Kirsten so that they are available to you with all my notes um, and, uh, and links for down the line, and you know, feel free to say hello and be in touch.